Hello everyone and welcome to CRAM Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby we bring you Crumb Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Uh, today we're going to have a look at a very interesting paper uh, that talks about stoma-free survival after an osteomotic leak, uh, after a rectal cancer resection. Um, this will be followed by a teaching session by Professor Sababala Subramanian on systematic review and meta-analysis. I'll leave you to it. Okay. Hello, I am Sai, full name Sai, I'm Papa Jun, call me Sai, it's my first name. I'm here today with Gio, we're going to present a journal which was published in the British Journal of Surgery, and uh, the topic goes by a stoma free survival after an stomach leap following rectal cancer resection in a worldwide cohort of 2007, sorry, 2470 patients. So uh, I will let the introductions to for Gio. Yeah, so as we all know, colorectal cancer is very common and rectal uh, cancer in particular uh, represents uh, a clinical problem on a daily basis for colorectal surgeons and oncologists. Uh, what we do for it depends a lot on stage, location of the rectal tumor, and certainly we do a lot of operations with a primary anastomosis with patients that uh, do have rectal cancer. Uh, so Sai, back to you for more introduction. Yes, so the anastomotic leak that we're trying to uh, focus on during the surgery is is one of the most feared uh, complications from this restorative rectal cancer, anterior resections we're talking about exactly. And uh, it is stated that the, there is a high incidence of up to 20% of from de developing from the surgeries and it's also associated with increased morbidity and mortality like prolonged hospital stay, reintervention, return to the, the surgery or even a high risk of a permanent stoma and uh, of course, death of the patient as well. Um, a variety of treatment options are described in the literature. A lot of what we do depends on the clinical symptoms of the patient and how bad the leak is. Uh, certainly fecal diver diversion, abscess drainage, or uh, the whole anastomosis takedown sometimes is necessary. But there's a couple of new things, a couple of new kids in the block that uh, have been uh, recently studied or introduced. One of them is certainly the endoscopic vacuum therapy also known as endoclose or endosponge. Uh, and those are devices that basically create a vacuum in the uh, anastomotic leak cavity and allow for it to collapse and granulate. You can see a picture here on the right. And this is kind of where this paper sits on, trying to evaluate uh, how often this is used and uh, how useful it is. Um, so Sai, back to you. Yes, thank you. So the aim of this study is to essentially study about a one year stoma through survival after four of these treatment modalities. So these four modalities are salvage surgery, fecal diversion with passive drainage, fecal diversion with active drainage, and no fecal diversion. And the definition of what we do for this specific modalities will be explained later in the, in the presentation. Back to you, Gio. <laughs> So uh, the study itself is an international retrospective core study, uh, including data from 216 centers in 45 countries. So a fairly extensive uh, set of participants, I have to say. Um, the uh, court itself is made of uh, adult patients undergoing rectal cancer surgery uh, between 2014 and 2018 uh, that were diagnosed with an anastomotic leak at some point after their operation. Um, in order to be included, you have to add a surgical resection and a creation of a primary anastomosis with or without a defunctioning stoma, and benign operations and emergency cases were excluded. Uh, the um, authors uh, also do uh, use propensity score matching um, for active versus passive drainage, which we will define in details in the next few slides. Uh, both to you. Yes. So, well, so first of all, we will define what salvage surgery in term, as one of the modalities means. So basically what this means is when there is an anastomotic leak, we will try to dismantle or take down anastomosis and formation of an end colostomy or redoing the anastomosis in the same surgery or in a delayed fashion. That's what they defined as a salvage surgery. Back to you, Joe. Um Fecal diversion um, with a drainage is the second strategy uh, and the third strategy that the authors analyze. So 
in both these groups, a stoma is formed that can be at surgery or uh, when the anastomotic leak is diagnosed. Uh, and passive drainage is defined as basically putting a drain into a transabdominally or transglutally into a collection uh, or using um, a form of surgical washout, um, would it be laparoscopic or open uh, or lavage. Uh, active drainage involves the use of a um, endoscopic vacuum therapy, basically, which is the endosponge that we discussed at the start of uh, this presentation. Uh, both of you, Sai, for uh, a bit more. Thank you. So no fecal diversion is basically conservative management without the formation of a stoma. So conservative management could either be one or a combination of the following modalities, which are antibiotics, drainage, clipping, stenting, or even a transanal closure. So no fecal diversion basically means no stoma. And the study outcomes that the authors chose, uh, as again, this is a cohort study, so uh, the primary outcome per se is not a true primary outcome. Uh, but the, first of all, look at one year stoma-free survival, which basically means being alive without a temporary or permanent stoma one year after their operation, their original one. Secondary outcomes they look at are failure of first treatment modality. So basically, you have an attempt at uh, antibiotics and drainage that fails, and you end up having a Hartman's procedure. Um, the uh, formation of a secondary anastomosis, the uh, duration of the hospital stay, uh, presence of ICU admissions, as well as the length and duration of stay, and finally, time for leak to heal, which is defined radiologically or endoscopically, and sometimes clinically, depending on where the leak is and criteria adopted by the unit. Um, Ball to you, side. Yeah, so the... The, the, the study goes like this. So initially there were about 2,700 patients and then from the exclusion criteria and every, when everyone's being excluded, there were about 2,470 patients left. And then we could see all the number of patients who went into the specific treatment modalities as we discussed. So next slide will be the overall outcome. Yeah, so as you can see here, um, there's four groups. The um, most common uh, treatment modalities adopted in this cohort was fecal diversion and passive drainage. And, and as you can see, and, and as you would expect, really, the vast majority of people that had salvage surgery as um, their main modality of choice had very poor one-year stoma-free survival. Well, they have a stoma to save their life, and that stoma sticks with them. Um, and uh, equally, as you can guess, people that uh, have uh, no fecal diversion at all have the best uh, stoma-free rate at one year. Uh, in the middle, we've got the fecal diversion with passive drainage and fecal diversion with active drainage. And as you can see, they are pretty similar between each other. Yep. Sorry about that. Uh, um, so um, one just a brief mention, as you can see, uh, the vast majority of the outcomes are fairly similar between fecal diversion uh, with passive or active drainage. And we go into details a bit more as, as we go along. Uh, Ball to you, Sai. Yeah. So as we were talking about primary salvage, uh, this is the data that we kind of like uh, handpicked from one of the one of the tables in there. So what we want to uh, focus upon on is the severity of the symptoms. So uh, the paper didn't specifically mention what severe symptoms actually say, probably might be sepsis, uh, abdominal uh, contamination, ischemic colon, and the defect in the anastomosis. So if you, uh, if you look at the primary salvage cohort, uh, study at uh, 40%, so 40%, 68%, 39%, and 76%. So a majority of the patients who have a very se uh, severe or a significant anastomotic leak, while compared to the rest of the study, uh, they are the num numbers and the percentage in re respect to the number of patients in the study remains the same. So we will get back to the slide in a few moments after where we discuss along in the presentation. So um, as I mentioned, and as expected, primary salvage surgery, poor one-year stoma-free survival, represents about 16% of the overall cohort here. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, in uh, most of the cases, um, the reason for choosing this modality is that these patients are just very sick. Um, so uh, it kind of sits as a court of its own. It's not really comparable with the other ones. And that's all this slide wants to say, really. Uh, both to you, Sai? Yep. So the other simple modality of no fecal diversion is obviously uh, with conservative management, the highest 
rate of stoma-free survival, about 65.4%. And uh, interestingly, when we were to go back to the previous uh, this previous slide, which I mentioned, a significant majority of these patients also have these severe symptoms. So it's quite interesting for in this study that this, these patients have a good stoma, uh, stoma free survival rate. But the paper itself argues that, you know, there is there might be a difference between patients who are just a seal leak with some mild purulent fluid or with a complete dehiscence with a four quarter peritonitis. So basically, they just say most of the patients who underwent and who underwent no fecal diversion with conservative management are less sick than the patients who had a primary salvage surgery. Yeah, so if this was not clear enough, uh, we do uh, recognize that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the two cohorts that we just discussed. And the two cohorts that we're really interested in and we do want to kind of look at are the uh, patients that have diversion uh, with active versus passive drainage. And that's exactly what the authors did here using propensity score matching. Um, if you look at this table, as you can see, they have a pretty good matching um, after uh, application of their propensity score model. Uh, they do one to two uh, matching. So as you can see, um, the uh, fecal diversion uh, and active drainage is 278 patients, um, both before and after PSM. Uh, and fecal diversion with passive drainage is 556. And as you can see, the um, actual outcomes are pretty similar between the two groups, uh, all across with the exception of um, patient requiring secondary salvage surgery, which is higher in uh, the, the use of the endosponge, as well as ICU stay, which is presumably related to the fact that uh, they are having another operation um, to salvage the leak. Um, Ball, back to you, Sai, for a bit more about results. Yes. So when we actually compare these uh, drainage methods, active versus passive, there was no significant risk in, sorry, there was no significant difference in between the risk. So the, sorry, the, the one year stoma free survival rate, but however, we could find a significant risk uh, favoring or, you know, against where active people who underwent active drainage are more in risk of having secondary salvage surgery, which meant more ICU admissions overall. But essentially, uh, no, not much difference in terms of a one-year stoma free survival rate. Absolutely. Um, a few limitations to highlight. Well, certainly the authors do um, recognize that there is selection bias here uh, related to the fact that obviously participating centers are, are represent still a selection of the overall population of leaks and that obviously there is a selection in terms of, of, of treatment choices. Um, there is a degree of missing data, the authors admit, and they used, uh, when necessary, uh, multiple imputation techniques to compensate for that. And they also state that they have double-checked and cross-referenced the uh, data set, although uh, to what extent that has been done is very unclear. Um, there are a few other limitations that we would like to discuss. Well, first of all, uh, pretty much all the outcomes that are um, recorded um, in uh, this study are somehow time-bound or protocol dependent. So, for example, um, if uh, you are planning to reverse someone that had a defunctioning blue paleostomy after an anterior resection, um, the timing by which you do that are dictated generally by uh, how long it's been since the previous operation, as well as availability of lists, et cetera, et cetera. If someone, uh, for whatever reason, is suitable for a reversal, but it's not reversed because within a year time, uh, there is just no facility to do that, then that would not be counted as a stoma-free survival, if that makes sense. Um, a similar concept applies to, for example, uh, anastomotically healing. Um, a lot depends on when you're assessing it. There's certainly uh, patients that do have the endosponge because of the nature of the endosponge itself that needs to be replaced, um, tend to have a, a higher rate of reassessment uh, across the year. Um, I'm not entirely sure what drove the variable choice for propensity score matching, meaning the authors do justify it, but there are a few other variables that perhaps I would have had included and they didn't do, such as diabetes, for example, which is known to increase the clinical relevance of an anastomotic leak. Um, there is uh, certainly a lot of clinical heterogeneity between the, gro the groups, and certainly there is also a technical issue with the application of the endosponge by certainly applying it at the start when you're learning uh, is harder than when you've already done it for a while. And obviously this is a technology that is relatively new. Um, so um, I'm not sure how much that could have potentially affected the results. 
Bob, back to start for some conclusion. Yes. So overall, the study is uh, is start finding out the one year stoma free survival rate of the four treatment modalities that we've mentioned. And then to sum it up, the lowest in, in the primary salvage surgery group of 13.7% and the highest in the conservatively managed uh, no stoma group, which is 65.4%. And then we found no difference in terms of the stoma free survival rate between the active and a passive drainage group with patients who underwent active drainage at a higher risk for a secondary salvage surgery and and an ICU admission at the same time. So these are the conclusion from this study. Thank you very much. As usual, a brief summary of the discussion we've had about the paper. Um, reiterated a few points that we made during the presentation, including the issues with selection bias. But we also had a very interesting discussion about the suitability of patients included in this study for each of the different treatments available. Not uh, every type of anastomotic leak is suitable for what the authors describe as diversion with active drainage. And not all leaks equally are suitable for diversion with passive drainage. Uh, this suggests that perhaps there is an intrinsic difference in the type of pathology that we're dealing with in the different groups that are compared, making the comparison and the 40 propensity score matching perhaps methodologically and clinically uh, irrelevant. Furthermore, we discussed how uh, adopting an approach that includes the use of the endosponge does uh, unavoidably um, mean providing your patient a more intense follow-up as the endosponge needs to be changed on a regular basis. This can be done through EUAs or endoscopy. Not all centers in the study would have the capacity to do so. So treatments might be available uh, in different ways depending on where you're treated. And finally, we touched upon the concept of uh, reactivation leak. Now, um, I must confess it took me a, a little while to uh, figure out what that is, and that is an anastomotic leak that becomes evident after the reversal of a defunctioning uh, loop aleostomy. In uh, some of the cohorts included in this study, uh, the rate of reactivation leak is fairly high, up to 10%, and there's a variety of ways by which this uh, can be avoided, including adequate preoperative workup. Obviously, these patients are complex and the heterogeneity between uh, the cohorts is, is quite significant. So we will ask the authors about this. Thank you. I'll leave you to Prof. Sabah teaching session. Last time we talked about what systematic reviews and uh, meta-analysis are. We talked about some essential principles. We talked about uh, the processes. And uh, I also had a couple of slides on how you go about searching the, the literature. So this time, um, I'm going to focus on a few additional concepts that are really important um, in this area. So the first one um, is what we call heterogeneity. So heterogeneity essentially um, it refers to differences between studies. So you can imagine how studies are going to be different in a variety of different ways. And uh, uh, understanding the differences between studies yeah. is quite important. Okay, so I was saying that um, we uh, um, need to talk about heterogeneity in the context of doing a systematic review or meta-analysis. This is a really important concept. And essentially, it refers to differences between studies. And I was um, suggesting that we think of an example. And the example um, could be, um, as it shows on the slide, um, a systematic review of studies comparing laparoscopic versus open adrenalectomy. And, and, uh, and if you say, um, if you consider that you have half a dozen studies, um, each of which is a randomized controlled trial comparing laparoscopic surgery against open surgery, and then you want to look at and the uh, uh, pulling the data from all of these studies and coming to uh, a conclusion about the uh, clinical outcomes following either laparoscopic or open surgery. Let's say that's what you want to do. Now, the first thing to think about is, are there um, clinical differences between these various studies? In other words, is there clinical heterogeneity? Now, you can imagine how um, there could be one study that compares lap versus open surgery in children and another study that compares lap versus open surgery in adults. And you can see how the studies are then clinically very different. Uh, 
There could be uh, another study that's actually looking at uh, a mixture of lap and robot versus open. And you can see how that would be very different to another study that is com simply compared lap versus open. And then all the patients in the lab group uh, undergo laparoscopic and uh, not robotic surgery. So um, there could be differences in the experience of surgeons uh, involved. So there could be all sorts of clinically important differences between the studies, and those all come under the category of clinical heterogeneity. Uh, the next um, kind of heterogeneity is what we refer to as methodological heterogeneity, where there are differences in uh, study designs. And, and differences in the methods employed. There could be an RCT where there's no blinding at all. There could be another RCT where there's blinding in certain aspects of uh, the study design. There could be differences in randomization, and there could be differences in how um, uh, the analysis are done, and so on and so forth. So all of this will come under the category of methodological heterogeneity. And the final uh, type of heterogeneity is what we call statistical heterogeneity, where there could be differences in um, estimates of treatment effect. For example, one RCT could um, show um, you data that says that the length of uh, hospital stay after surgery is much better with laparoscopic arm. And let's assume another RCT actually shows that the length of stay is much uh, uh, low with the open arm for whatever reason. Then you have two different studies coming up with uh, contradictory um, results or the treatment effects being uh, in opposite directions. And that would be a classic example of statistical heterogeneity. So these are the different types of heterogeneity. That's important to keep in mind. Why do we need to assess heterogeneity? Uh, well, um, we need to just assess it because if you're going to do a meta-analysis where, you, where you're bringing together the uh, um, effects that you see in the different groups across various studies, then we need to ensure that the various studies are homogeneous because otherwise you'd be pulling apples and oranges. And if you do that, then you are prone to making erroneous conclusions. So that is uh, why you really need to assess or look for heterogeneity. Uh, if you're reading a systematic review or if you're yourself doing a systematic review and deciding on whether you're going to do a meta-analysis or not. So um, to assess heterogeneity, again, let's look at the different categories. We said clinical, methodological, and statistical. So for clinical and methodological heterogeneity, uh, you really have to read the individual studies, read the papers um, in detail, and then uh, make an expert assessment. So you look at the population, the intervention, the uh, control group, and the outcomes. You look at the settings. And then you, as an expert surgeon, can decide on whether these studies are heterogeneous or not. Yeah, so that's clinical or methodological heterogeneity. It's a qualitative uh, assessment. For statistical heterogeneity, yes, the assess assessment can be qualitative, and you can look at the treatment effects, and you can look at the effect size and the direction of uh, the effect size. But also, you can look at it um, enumeratively. So you can um, um, you can um, draw forest plots. And you can do some statistical analysis to um, make a more objective assessment of heterogeneity. So when you come across assessment of statistical heterogeneity in meta-analysis, you will find that people talk about the chi-square test for heterogeneity, wherein you do a statistical assessment with the null hypothesis that all of the studies in your review are homogeneous. And then depending on what your chi-square value is and what p-value you get, you then either reject the null hypothesis uh, or uh, you fail to reject the null hypothesis that the studies are homogeneous. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. The other thing to do is to uh, uh, look at the uh, i-square statistic. So um, the I-square statistic, the higher the statistic, the higher is the heterogeneity. So you really want a very low I-square statistic. With the chi-square test for heterogeneity, um, you would 
and want the p-value of more than 0 0.05 because if you have a p-value of less than 0 0.05 then you reject the null hypothesis that the studies are homogeneous then you have to conclude that the studies are indeed heterogeneous okay so i hope that makes sense now if you have looked at heterogeneity and you've decided that the studies in your review are very heterogeneous then what do you do now, if there is clinical or methodological heterogeneity, then you just don't do a meta-analysis. So that will be uh, the right approach. So you avoid doing a meta-analysis in, uh, uh, in a systematic review where the studies are very heterogeneous. Now, if the studies are uh, relatively homogeneous uh, from the clinical perspective and the methodological perspective, but statistically speaking, if you find that there is significant heterogeneity in that the um, directions of treatment effects are contradictory in that one study says treatment A is better, the other study says treatment B is better, then um, you can either avoid doing a meta-analysis or you can consider, um, you know, there are some options. So there is some flexibility, if you like. The first thing to um, consider is um, subgroup analysis. So you do a subgroup analysis, and I'll explain subgroup analysis in another slide in a bit more detail, but effectively you could be doing a study that looks, at, you could be doing an analysis that looks possibly just at adults um, across the various studies, adults who have had laparoscopic versus open surgery. Uh, and then you can do an analysis looking just as ch just at children. And by doing subgroup analysis, you may be able to explain the reasons for the statistical heterogeneity. So that is one option. The other option is to analyze in accordance to what we refer to as a random effects model and uh, to calculate your summated effect size. So why do we do a meta-analysis? If you remember my previous um, talk, we do a meta-analysis so that, so that you can get to a summated effect size. What is the summary measure taking into account all of the studies in the meta-analysis? And there are different ways of doing this. One is referred to as the random effects modeling, and the other is called the fixed effects modeling. I'll explain that in the next slide. But just keep in mind that if you have statistical heterogeneity and you still want to do a meta-analysis, then consider the random effects model to calculate your summated effect size. And... Uh, um, the most important thing, I guess, would be uh, to emphasize that you have to interpret the results with caution. You have to explain in the discussion that the um, uh, effect sizes are quite different in the different studies, and it might even be in opposite directions. And therefore, you have to explain to the reader that the results are uh, to be interpreted with a, a high degree of caution. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to give a really brief introduction to random versus fixed effects modeling. We could probably have an entire session, probably from a more qualified person to talk about this. So I'm going to give you uh, only a very brief intro from a clinical perspective. So the first thing to say is that these are two ways in which you can do a meta-analysis, fixed effects modeling and random effects modeling. Some people will do both and leave it to the reader to decide. Now. If you um, do fixed effects modeling, what that means is that you're assuming that the treatment effects are common or very similar. Whereas if you do random effects modeling, then you're not making any such assumption. Okay, so I hope that uh, makes a little bit of sense. Effectively, whatever um, effect size you, uh, whatever summary effect size you're getting uh, is the weighted average of the study specific effect sizes. So basically you're looking at the effect size across various studies and you're bringing, pulling them all together. Now, obviously, you want to give different studies different weights because if you have a very large study, then obviously you'd want to give it more weightage. So that's why we say it's a weighted average of study-specific effect sizes. Now, in uh, fixed effects modeling, the weight is the inverse of the variance of study effect size. In other words, um, it refers to, uh, so you give more weight to a study where the effect size is more precise. So what will give you a very precise effect size? What will give you an effect size with very narrow conference intervals? A large um, study. So the sample size is large, then you are more confident with your results. 
you think that you've got the results with more precision and therefore you give more weight to the study. In a um, random effects modeling, weight takes into account not only um, the um, uh, variance or the precision, but also it is dependent on between study variance, what is referred to as heterogeneity. So you take into account not only the sample sizes, but also um, the heterogeneity between studies. When um, you are doing fixed effects modeling, and the inferences you make should be restricted to the population that's included in your systematic review and meta-analysis, right? Uh, but when you're doing random effects modeling, uh, the inferences that you, uh, it, did you make are about the treatment effects in future trials. So you're talking about the distribution of treatment effects. Now, if the heterogeneity is very small, and we're talking about statistical heterogeneity here, then it doesn't matter which model you, you use, both of them will give you similar results or should give you similar results, okay? And you keep in mind that if you're uh, employing a random effects model, which I said is what you should do if there is a, a significant statistical heterogeneity, then um, you have to keep in mind that this gives more weight to small studies and also the results are more conservative. Okay, so I hope that explains a little bit about fixed versus random effects modeling, but I have simplified my explanation quite a bit. Um, so hopefully that's useful. Now let's go on to sensitivity and sub subgroup analysis. So if you're reading a paper uh, um, uh, that essentially incorporates a systematic review and meta-analysis, then you will come across these terms. Now, when you're doing the analysis, you will have to be making a lot of decisions about whether to include certain studies or not, or whether to include certain groups of patients or not. For example, we're talking about um, uh, a review of studies comparing lap versus open adrenalectomy. So um, the first question could be, do we include studies where they've got both adults and children in, this, in the um, uh, randomization? along with all the other studies that are primarily on adults. Um, you could then uh, also um, think about uh, whether you ha have to include studies that have got a very poor design, that have not done blinding appropriately, if that's uh, feasible, and so on. You could also think about whether um, you should be including studies that um, include certain patients that are not necessarily present in most studies, like, for example, adrenalectomy in the super obese category of patients. So these are the things that you have to decide upon when you're doing your analysis. And if you um, uh, then say, well, I will do the analysis in different ways with and without including these additional studies or these groups of patients, then you have to see whether your summary findings are independent of these decisions. So effectively, what you've then done is sensitivity analysis, whereby you uh, change the decisions you make with regards to including studies and groups of patients, and then you're looking at, at the results. And if your results are the same in that the treatment A is better than treatment B or LAP is better than open, regardless of these decisions, then you say that you've done sensitivity analysis and you still got the same results and therefore the results are much more robust. In other words, you're asking the question, would repeating the analysis by changing these decisions change the and final conclusions. And that's what is referred to as sensitivity analysis. So I hope that makes some sense. This is a bit different to subgroup analysis. The concepts are similar um, and, uh, um, and you could consider subgroup analysis as a type of sensitivity analysis, but in subgroup analysis, you're producing estimates of the effect size in subgroups. For example, uh, let's go back to the same example of children versus adults. So what you're saying is in children, laparoscopic appendicect uh, adrenalectomy uh, reduces hospital stay by, say, two or three days. So that is a separate effect size that you've got in children. And then you, uh, you calculate a further effect size in adults. And you might say in adult patients, laparoscopic um, adrenalectomy also reduces hospital stay by maybe four days or five days. So what you're doing is uh, in subgroup analysis, you're producing um, your summary effect size 
for various subgroups. Okay, so I hope that um, is um, clear. I'll then move on to um, a couple of plots you will often see in metanalysis. The first is a forest plot and then is a funnel plot. I'll go through, to, through these two and, and then that will be the end of our discussion. So the forest plot, right. So a forest plot is essentially a plot that is used to compare a specific outcome in two different groups, two different groups. You can't have more than two different groups reported on by a number of studies um, and uh, the studies have to be similar that's important so the studies shouldn't be clinically heterogeneous or methodologically heterogeneous and this is usually done as part of a meta-analysis so if you're not doing a meta-analysis then then you're not producing a forest plot okay so that's important to keep in mind uh, outcome refers to the occurrence of a disease or or the effects of an intervention uh, and in our example, comparing lap versus open adrenalectomy, one outcome could be uh, length of stay, for example. Another outcome could be readmission rates. Uh, the groups um, essentially are the two groups we've discussed. In our example, it would be a laparoscopic group and open group. And the studies are usually randomized control trials or observational studies. Typically, you know, in a Cochrane review, you will have randomized control trials. What you don't want to do, or most people say you shouldn't do, is combine randomized control trials and observation studies in the same forest plot. Like you wouldn't want to combine RCTs and observation studies in the same meta-analysis. Okay, so you wouldn't want to do that. Okay, so here's an example of a forest plot. This is what a forest plot uh, usually would uh, look like. Um, uh, this bit, on the right hand side of the screen uh, in this particular forest plot you've got four different studies and just to explain what we're looking at we're looking at hypocalcemia rate after total thyroidectomy in patients with graves and comparing them with patients without graves disease so um just break this down so you have the studies listed on the left hand side uh, these could be listed in the chronological order of uh, their publication that's usually what is done then you have the results for the primary outcome for each of the studies in the different groups laid out side by side. So in Graves patients, you have the number of people with hypercalcemia. In the non-Graves cohort, you have the number of people with hypocalcemia. And basically, you list down all of the um, uh, results just for the primary outcome in these four studies, one below the other. And then you look at the uh, effect size. In this case, the effect size is described as the odds ratio. So the odds ratio is listed down along with the conference intervals for these four studies. And then you've got the forest plot, okay? So just looking at the forest plot, um, the squares refer to the effect size and the weight of these studies. The weight, like I said before, depends on um, uh, sample size usually or some aspect of sample size. The horizontal line on either side of the square refers to the conference interval for that particular effect size, okay? The diamond that you see here refers to the summated effect size, which is basically uh, the aggregate of these four effect sizes, okay? The center of the diamond will be your um, summated effect size and the tips of the diamond would be your 95% conference intervals for the summated effect size. So the vertical line, the vertical solid line, refers to the line of no effect. So for example, if the conference intervals overlap the vertical line, then you know that that study has given you a non-significant result. In other words, the p-value will be more than 0 0.05 for that study. So the first two studies here would probably have a p-value of more than 0 0.05 because their conference intervals overlap the line of no effect, which is the vertical solid line. Now, the um, you could, if you want, plot a, a dotted uh, line like I've shown you here, the red dotted line, that usually runs through uh, the summated effect size, okay? So, um, so that shows you the summated measure. Like I said before, the edges of the diamond, um, you have to um, look at it and you have to see if it overlaps the line of no effect or not. If it doesn't overlap the line of no effect, then it means that you've got a significant result for the summated effect size. So um, 
the FX size doesn't necessarily have to be a, an odds ratio. It could be any ratio. It could be an, a, a ratio such as relative risk, or sometimes it can simply be the difference, uh, like the mean difference uh, in hospital stay, for example. And the line of no effect is usually at one if it's a ratio, which means there's no difference between the groups. Um, but um, if it is a difference, then the line of no effect should be at zero, right? Because you're looking at no difference between groups. So the two key questions for you, if you're looking at a forest plot, are what is the summated measure? For that, you look at the middle of this diamond, the vertical um, dotted red line, like I showed in the previous slide. And the second question you want to ask is, does, do the edges of the diamond overlap the line of no effect? So those are the two key questions. And also uh, keep in mind that the forest plot shows you statistical heterogeneity. So in this particular forest plot, you can see that all of these squares are on the same side of the line of no effect or on the right-hand side. So you could argue that there is not much statistical heterogeneity in this uh, meta-analysis. Okay, we're now going on to uh, the funnel plot couple of slides on the funnel plot. So essentially, uh, one of the problems with uh, meta-analysis is that um, you're only using published data. And there are many studies that um, may have been completed, but for one reason or the other, the studies um, don't get published. A common reason you could assume is that studies don't get published if there's no um, obvious treatment uh, difference between two groups. Um, so there's no obvious difference in outcomes between uh, two treatments. So these studies um, are often uh, are, are difficult to get published. And um, therefore, you could argue that there could be some quite significant systematic differences between studies that are published and studies that are not published, you know, on the same topic. And this um, causes the phenomenon referred to as publication bias wherein what you're saying is that the summated measure may not really represent the true effect because studies with negative results don't get published. And therefore, uh, you could argue that uh, what's published is probably an exaggerated uh, estimate of the true effect, right? And um, it could be that, or it could just be that uh, there's delayed publication, um, multiple um, publications that causes um, uh, difference in, uh, in the true effect. And there could be language and citation bias. You know, studies published in some uh, languages don't necessarily make it into meta-analysis, which usually often uh, uses English language literature. So one way to assess whether there's publication bias or not is what the funnel plot is all about. Right, so this is an example of the funnel plot. You can see the reference. Um, this uh, I took this picture of the BMJ from 10, 12 years ago. On the x-axis, you have the effect size, the odds ratio, or the relative risk, or the difference. On the y-axis, you have some uh, measure of the precision of the study, which usually relates to sample size. And then you've got this dotted triangle, which covers the area within which 95% of your studies should lie. Uh, ideally lie if there's no publication bias. And then you've got this um, vertical line here, which represents the summary measure. So this is the summary uh, measure that you've calculated in your meta-analysis. And each um, of these um, blue dots refer to the individual studies. Now, the solid vertical line is a line of no effect. And it is at one because you're looking at ratios here. For ratios, it's got to be one. For differences, it's got to be zero. So what you're doing is you're looking for symmetry around the vertical dotted line. So if there are a fair number of studies, i.e. blue dots on either side of the dotted line, you can say, well, there's no obvious um, problem. There's no obvious publication bias. If there's asymmetry, it could be because of publication bias, or it could be because of differences between studies, heterogeneity that we discussed. It could be because of some problem in reporting uh, and uh, methodological issues. And finally, it could just be pure chance. Now, we tend to, as clinicians, tend to look at this visually and we look for symmetry of the dots around the uh, middle vertical line. 
Um, and then we probably, you know, are reassured that there is not much heterogeneity. Uh, sorry, there's not much publication bias. But ideally, um, you ought to um, do statistical testing to see if there's publication bias or not. There are a number of different tests available, but uh, clearly that's not something that um, I would be able to explain to you in, in any great detail. I'll leave it to the experts. So, and there's a link there if you want to have a look at. Right, um, we do use uh, funnel plots in surgery when we're comparing the outcomes of different centers or we're comparing the outcomes of different surgeons. And uh, here's a classic example of a funnel plot that looks at a particular complication on the y-axis versus surgeon volume on the x-axis. So each of these little circles represents an individual surgeon. So if you are the individual surgeon and you know which, um, uh, and you know you are represented by a specific circle, you can see where you are in relation to all the other surgeons. Okay, so the funnel plot um, is um, quite often used in the NHS by various surgical societies or uh, by people interested in quality improvement and in uh, identifying outliers in surgical outcomes. And um, they do employ funnel plots quite a lot. That's it. Um, so that's the end. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.